Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the People on the Go Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Melissa Sweat, and I'll be moderating our session today. Before we start, let's just do a quick technology check to make sure that you can hear me just fine and see the screen. Go ahead and locate the questions panel in GoToWebinar and just type in a brief note, a yes, a hi, hello, letting me know that all sounds good. Awesome, thank you so much for those confirmations there. By the way, if you are needing any assistance, the number to call is right there on the screen, 1-800-263-6317, and I'll also be on in the chat panel and in the Q&A to help you as well. Today's session is Human First, How Mobile is Becoming an Extension of Ourselves. And I have with me S.C. Moati, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. A quick background about why we have these sessions, especially for those who are with us for the first time. We have these sessions because our focus at People on the Go is productivity in the workplace. And the topics that you see on the screen are the topics that we cover. We offer these workshops in a variety of formats, including the webinar format like today's session, which is a popular format for us. The webinars are offered on a monthly basis, and you can feel free to check them out on our website, people-onthego.com slash webinars. We also offer many training options as well, and you can check those out on the screen here, on-site corporate, webinar training, and public offerings as well. I'd also like to invite you to become an active member of our Accomplishing More with Less community. You can check out our blog on our website, and you can also find us by searching Accomplishing More with Less on Facebook and LinkedIn and join our groups. You can also follow our founder, Pierre Kwand, on Twitter. One more final and fun notice is that we'll be giving away five copies of SC Moati's new book, mobilized, which just hit uh, the top spot in Amazon. It's now a bestseller, which is very exciting. So we'll be giving away five copies today. And all you have to do is just stick around until the end and I'll let you know how you can enter to win. All right, and with that, let's go ahead and dive into today's topic. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce SC now. SC Moati dedicates her time and energy helping companies succeed with mobile. She is the author of Mobilized, an insider's guide to the business and future of connected technology, and has been called a genius at making mobile products people love. While serving as an executive at mobile pioneers like Facebook, Trulia, and Nokia, SC launched and monetized mobile products that are now used by billions of people and have received prestigious awards, including an Emmy nomination. Today, she runs Products That Count, an organization that advises businesses on how to leverage mobile technology and produces some of the largest product events in the world, including the Manifesto Conference. She also serves on the boards of both public and private companies, including mobile technology giant Opera Software. SC speaks frequently at conferences and has been featured in Forbes and is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review and the Huffington Post. She lectures on mobile and innovation at Stanford University, where she earned her MBA and Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. For more information on SC, please visit scmoati.com. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to SC. This transition will take just a moment. Thank you, Melissa. I hope everyone can hear me, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Looks and sounds great, SC. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is really what are the rules behind the most successful mobile products, and you will see that um, you know, a lot has happened with mobile. I'll talk about how it created a new gold rush and really how becoming successful in mobile is more 
about making a successful cultural transformation inside organizations. And then I'll talk about that human first aspect, the formula behind the most successful mobile products. And you'll see that it's a, you know, it sounds simple. It sounds like a, you know, what, what makes us great people is what makes great mobile product. I will use the uh, mind, body, spirit framework to discuss the, these rules uh, behind um, great mobile products. And if you come out of this presentation thinking that um, what I shared with you seems almost too simple to be true, that's exactly the feeling that I want to create. Because I believe that if we remember that even for a few seconds when we're at our computers or when we're at work or when we're, you know, uh, stuck in traffic and, and thinking about, you know, work and, and how to live a, a life that's more meaningful around technology, then that's, that's exactly uh, how we will create uh, better mobile experiences. All right, so Melissa introduced me. Um, what you see in the background are, uh, is a picture of um, our monthly uh, product events in San Francisco. We have um, speakers that are C-level at um, Netflix or Slack or Amazon, uh, some of the largest uh, technology companies. So um, let's start with the basics, right? Mobile has created a new gold rush. And what do I mean by that really is that today in most countries, mobile represents 4% of the global domestic product. And in countries like South Korea, it represents 11%. And that's according to the Boston Consulting Group. So it's no small deal. It's actually a big deal. It's a big chunk of our economy. and um, the, the, the unique thing about mobile is that it's all about private money. So unlike utilities like electricity and water, where very much it is about government programs, mobile is all private money. And so naturally what that means is that every company wants and really should get a meaningful piece of it. Now, the way most companies go about this gold rush is they go about it as if it's a technology transition. And I'll start by giving you the example of Facebook and how it transitioned into mobile. Initially, the company thought that mobile was just a new technology, a new programming language. And so it took all of its engineers, trained them to the languages of you know, iOS and Android and all these technical terms and said, OK, we're done. And the stock went from $40 down to $20. It's not until Facebook realized that becoming mobile was a cultural transition as opposed to a technology transition that the company saw its stock go from $20 all the way above $100 as it is today. Now, how did it go about it? Uh, it looked at its core value. And at the time, one of the core values was move fast and break things, which is perfectly fine if you have a, you know, a website that's for the most part free. When something goes wrong, you take a few engineers and you do what is called a patch and you fix the broken problem and it takes a few hours, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. But it's fairly easy to do. Well, on mobile, imagine what happens. Because on mobile, when you release a new product, it can take weeks to take to get into effect. Why? Because the mobile ecosystem has some quality standards, and you have probably heard of, uh, you know, the App Store approval processes, which sometimes take a couple of weeks, sometimes more. And so, what it means is that if you have a broken product on mobile, it will be broken not for hours, but it will be broken for weeks. And what happens when a product is broken for weeks? People get upset, they stop using it, sometimes they leave bad reviews, they delete it. In other words, it sticks with you. It's not something that can be undone. So Facebook looked at this and realized that if it wanted to succeed with mobile, it had to change its core value from move fast and break things to just move fast, no more breaking things. Now you may think this is 
just applicable to Facebook or to another, you know, Silicon Valley unicorn or even to another technology company. But I see that with every single company that I speak with today, no matter the industry, no matter the size, every one of them is looking at mobile and saying, we need to become mobile first because we know that this is how we're going to survive, but we don't know how. What does it take to become mobile first? And that's a bit the million dollar question. Now, just like Facebook, most companies approach becoming mobile first like it's a technology problem. So they think back at the last technology problem they had to solve, which is the transition to the internet and the web, and they say, we're going to apply the same recipe. The thing is that when they transitioned to the web, they had, say, a catalog, and they said, let's put that on the web. And if you remember these early websites, they were very heavy, very static, few pictures, lots of text, no way to buy, no way to leave reviews, no way to, to, to see comparable products. Today, they make, they make you laugh, most likely, but back then, I'm pretty sure they would make you cry, or at least they made me cry. And that is because um, that is a, a technology approach to cultural transition. So if you do the same thing on mobile today, you're going to look at your website and say, let's take that website and put it on a mobile device. And a mobile device is a smartphone or a watch or a pair of glasses. Soon it will be a pair of clothing or a pill or some, or, or some um, very, very mobile um, and, and uh, contextual product. So putting that website onto a very tiny screen that's very contextual does not work. It does not work for a lot of reasons. It does not work, first of all, because it's you know, real estate constrained, but also because on mobile, people are in an environment that is very distracting. And our websites have been created for an environment where we are actually very focused. So, so that uh, technology approach doesn't work. Now, a lot of other companies, uh, a lot of companies then go and, and look at customer trends and they say, well, we have more people using mobile products than using computers. So our marketing department really needs to put a lot more dollars onto mobile marketing. And mobile marketing, when you don't have a mobile product, has very limited options. You can do a little bit of advertising, you can do a little bit of coupon and promotion, but really the options are limited. So what happens is that after a while, the marketing department goes to engineering and product and design and says, you know, if we want to do effective mobile marketing, we really need a mobile product. And so engineering, design, product sits together and say, great, we're going to build something cool and something new. And it's not just one product. It's one app for iOS, right, for Apple, one app for Android, for the Google phones or the Samsung phones. And sometimes or often, it's also a so-called responsive website, which is a website that runs smoothly on, on a mobile device. Or sometimes it's also a, an app for tablet or an app for uh, watches. And so it's not just one product. It's a whole set of products. And then they bring their plans and roadmaps to um, get approved by the CEO and the CFO. And these guys look at it and say, that is really expensive, right? Where is this really worth the investment? And so the CEO is left with the, the marketing team that says, we really need to do mobile marketing, otherwise we're going to die. And in order to do it well, we need great products. The product and engineering organization saying, Great product costs a lot of money because there are so many platforms on mobile. And the CFO that says the ROI is just not there. Now, the thing is that um, mobile is actually the main dish, right? It's not a side dish or it's not an entry. It's not, uh, it's not um, optional to go on mobile. And every organization knows that because mobile made its way into the organization with what is known today as BYOD, bring your own device. And so the janitor and the salesperson and the account manager all brought their devices into the organization and they say, we really need to become mobile. So the cultural challenge that is posed by mobile 
is that we constructed these complex organizations and structured structures as a result of the industrial revolution, right? We have processes, we decompose the way we do things in small tasks, in functions, we escalate issues, we de-escalate issues, and now we're seeing this massive cultural shift which is mobile and mobile doesn't care about organization mobile is already everywhere and so the cultural transformation that is mobile is really forgetting the rigidity of the organization and thinking people to people it's undoing everything that the industrial revolution has done for us which is to put structure structures organizations and processes in place and that, for most companies, sounds like a big challenge. But the truth is actually much more simple than this. The truth is, because it's a people-to-people -people culture, we intuitively know what is good in terms of mobile product. And what is good in terms of mobile product is what is good for us. It's what I call the mobile formula. So if you think of, you know, forget mobile for a moment, right? What matters to us? What do we love? What do we want? The, the aspiration that we have for us as people is, uh, if you look at it through mind, body, spirit, is we want to look good. We want to have meaning in our life. And then we want to keep learning and growing. Well, it's exactly the same with our mobile products. Mobile products today are extensions of ourselves. And they may look like clunky extensions of ourselves, right? The big heavy rectangle that is your smartphone is a clunky extension of yourself. If you think about, you know, losing your smartphone, it takes, it takes only on average minutes to realize that you lose your smartphone because it has become almost like an external limb. Now, if you think of mobile products the way you think of yourself, the best mobile products are examples of your best self. And this is where this human-first approach of the mobile formula comes in. So the best mobile product, they operate by beauty. The best mobile product, they give us meaning. And then they also finally learn as we use them. So let me dig into each of these three rules, like each of these three human-first rules. First, the body rule. So the way I think about the body rule is um, if somebody really beautiful walks into a restaurant, what happens? Everybody looks at them. And it doesn't matter whether they're young, old, old tall, small, male, female. Everybody is in awe and looks at them. Now, if I ask most of you to define what makes that person beautiful, you, may, you will likely have a hard time. And you won't be the only one, because in history, <laughs> it has been a challenge to define beauty for centuries. In fact, there are really two camps. There's a rational camp and a more emotional camp. The rational camp is composed of mathematicians who have dedicated years of their lives trying to define beauty with a formula. So Pythagoras in ancient Greece was one of them. He said, you know, there's a, there's a way that music is, is beautiful and it's, you know, you divide uh, different notes in different mathematical ratios and that's what creates harmonics and that is what makes beautiful music. And then other people invented the golden means. In the 20th century, a mathematician called Virchow invented a formula for beauty. And basically what these people say is beauty is bring order out of chaos. So the most beautiful mobile products Similarly, they create um, efficiency where such that nothing is wasted. So if, if I pick an example of a product that, that follows that rule, I would pick Pandora. Pandora is taking billions of songs and rating each of them against hundreds of criteria. Criteria such as syncopation or rhythm or genre, and these criteria um, are, are called uh, globally the music genome. So billions of songs, hundreds of criteria, yet when Pandora creates radio stations for us, what do we need to do? We lean back and then we thumb up or we thumb down. 
ultimate simplicity, right? So taking that immense complexity and reducing it to summing, I think, is a, is a perfect example of efficiency and the rational aspect of beauty. Now let's look for a second at what it means for your own product or your, your product to be. The, the, the test that I use to understand whether a product will pass that efficiency rule, I call the thumb test. And the thumb test goes like this. If I can complete a task with a mobile product uh, relatively easily, just with a thumb, then this product passes the thumb test. It is efficient enough that I don't lose my focus when I use it. I don't, you know, incidentally press like and, and get directed to do something that I didn't want to do. It's relatively simple. It's efficient. Now, the second aspect of, of beauty on mobile, uh, remember that restaurant example from the beginning, is what I call the wow. So that comes from, you know, a, 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 a trend of thinkers who, like Leo Tolstoy, for example, the writer, who said, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. We cannot define what beauty is. We can only experience it. It's that, you know, immense, intense feeling we have that completely skips our consciousness. Well, on mobile, I think it's exactly the same thing. When I look at one, of the, one example of, of a mobile product that I found, uh, beautiful in that wow fashion, I think of Airbnb. So Airbnb will let you, for example, add places you love that you find beautiful to a wish list. And that wish list used to be um, codified with a star. So you would star a place. Now a star is a very rational way of thinking. A star is saying, well, if it's the right moment, if it's the right price, if it's the right time, if the place is available, then maybe I would like to go and stay there. Very, very um, rational. And then the team changed that star to a heart, as in, oh, I love this place. I would like to go there someday. There's no more rational there. And what turns out to happen is that 30% more people started adding places to their wish list just by this small change from a rational to an emotional instinct. So what does that mean for the mobile products that you, know, you or your teams are building is that they need to pass what I call the mom test. And the mom test is this, right? When I tell my mother what I do, most of the time she'll say, uh-huh, that's really interesting. I, OK, great, great, fantastic. And then sometimes she's, she, she'll actually get what I do, right? All that technology and stuff. She'll be like, oh my god, that's what you do? Oh, I totally get it. Well, that is the mom test. If your mobile product passes that test of somebody using it, not necessarily understanding it, and then all of a sudden, boom, they get it, then you have passed the mom test and you have created wow. So remember, Every mobile product needs to be beautiful. There's a rational way to look at beauty and think about the thumb test and, and efficiency. And then there's an emotional way to think about beauty and think about the mom test and this wow factor. Now, let's look at the second rule of human first and successful mobile products, which is the spirit rule. So the way that I describe the spirit rule is um, it's all about relationships. So when you meet someone new, all of a sudden, you want to spend all your time with them, right? Someone significant. You want to spend all your time with them. And they guess your secret desires. And they are here for you exactly when you need them. And then after a while, you start introducing that person into your communities. And then sometimes, you know, things become uh, a little bit more complicated. Maybe your friends will not like that person, or your family will have some hesitation, things like that. And so you have a little bit of that, you know, love-hate relationship for a while. Well, it's exactly the same thing with our mobile products. When I think about my GPS, for example, I love my GPS. It finds me wherever I am. It knows where I want to go. And I cannot live without it, to be honest. But then I realized that other people, will actually use GPS 
to know where I am, and I don't really like that. So there's a, a sort of an internal way that we look at, you know, finding meaning and building relationship with mobile, and we love that. And then there's an external way, which is how we take mobile into our communities. And there we have a lot of work to do. We haven't figured out a lot of the social norms and rules of how to be in communities with our mobile products. Now, if I, if I think about how that applies to the products of you know, your own company, uh, what I look at are uh, sets of filters. I look at internal filters, like connections to people and places that matter to you that allow to personalize your experience. For example, uh, a dating service like Tinder will use your location, will use your friends and your interests to match you with people who are nearby and share something in common with you. So these people and places filters are very important to allow you to build very personalized products. That's the internal part. And then I look at external filters, which are things like privacy policies or reviews, ratings, and permissions that you give to you know, a service to access certain information. And there, um, what, what, you know, again, um, what I think is happening is we have yet to establish the right social norms and the right rules for the way our mobile products interact in our communities. Okay, so now this third rule, the mind rule. The mind rule is, is all about learning. And when we learn, um, there's, there's uh, several ways that we learn, and it's a right, right brain, left brain um, problem, right? So in many ways, what, the way we learn is, is very scientific and incremental. And in other ways, it's really disruptive and, and more I will say more artistic. So let me give you an example, like any you know any hobby that um, you might practice. I, I did martial arts for uh, quite a few years, and my teacher would always tell me, "Look, practice makes perfect." So I'd go and practice my moves every day, and every day would you know incrementally get better, and I would incrementally get a little stronger and a little more uh, skilled at um, martial arts. And then after a while, I would find that. I'm, I'm plateau, I'm stagnating. And if I kept at it, then all of a sudden, after a little while, I would reach another level and sort of relearn everything that I had learned before. So the way we learn, right, there's that incremental way. And then there's that more disruptive, like reaching a new level way. Same thing on mobile. And on mobile, the ways that company learn to make better products is, um, also both scientific and artistic. Now, before I, I dive into it, why is it so important? It's important because on mobile, behaviors change week to week, months to months. One person, on average, changes phone every 18 months. Behaviors towards um, the capabilities of mobile evolve from week to week. Sometimes people will want to receive something like a push notification to their phone. Sometimes they will be completely opposed to, for example, sharing their health data, and then after a while they get used to it and they are more comfortable doing so. So behaviors change so fast that companies can go out of business in a matter of one year or two years. And we have some examples of that in our recent history with Kodak and a lot of other companies. So learning is a really, really critical part of what makes for successful mobile product because they need to improve um, incrementally with scientific methods and disruptively with more artistic methods. So the example I use there uh, of a mobile product that is really good at this is WhatsApp. If you use the mobile messaging service WhatsApp, you will see that when you send someone a message, it will show like two little check marks when the message has been delivered. And then these two check marks, they will turn a different color, they will turn green, when that message has been read. Now you may wonder, like, why is it important for a user of WhatsApp to know that this message has been delivered and then that it has been read, as opposed to some other signal, maybe it has been 
you know, um, it, it's on its way, or maybe it has been shared, or maybe it has been open, or something like that. Well, that is the incremental part of learning. The WhatsApp team looked at what people were reacting to very, very um, systematically. They set um, metrics and they analyzed everything. They use methodologies like growth hacking or agile methodologies. And they realized that these were the things that mattered. Overall, all these scientific methods, they boil down to some one key principle, which is you set a goal, everything that leads towards that goal becomes a funnel, and then you optimize that funnel. Now, after a while, the challenge is that it creates incremental returns. And so you need to resort to more artistic tools or, or disruptive approaches. And there are ways that you can do that, that I talk about in my book, that tools like hooks and tools like funnels and shortcuts that will get you to all of a sudden achieve a different level. So for example, on WhatsApp, um, WhatsApp recently released a, a feature that is encryption. So all the messages that people send on WhatsApp are now encrypted. Why that is completely disruptive is that is because nobody asked for messages to be encrypted. But if WhatsApp wants to penetrate an enterprise market, then it needs to make sure that it respects the rules demanded by IT departments for security and encryption and um, protection against um, cyber attacks. Another tool that I um, recommend using for, for learning is the so-called Net Promoter Score. The Net Promoter Score is a very uh, simple and intuitive way for companies to understand whether they are learning the right thing because it's completely focused on impact. What it does is immediately after you've completed a task, it asks you how likely you are to recommend a service to a friend and if you, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10. And if you rank it very highly, then you will be a promoter. And if not, then you will be a detractor. So the Net Promoter Score metric doesn't care about effort, really. It only cares about impact. And I think that it is a key metric to keep in mind when using mobile, because it is really focused on learning and making sure that there is actually um, an impact and growth on the service. So a little bit about my book. Um, it launched on Monday. and. It's been a very exciting process because this is the results of 10 to 12 years of research, and not just based on my experience at Facebook and Nokia and Trulia, but also based on dozens of interviews with companies like Slack and Airbnb, Uber, Pandora, and many more. If you have any question about it, please go check out my website, scmoatti.com. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, SC. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take control back of the screen here. And we'll get into the Q&A in just a moment. If you have some questions, please go ahead and start to ask them now in that questions panel. And we will get back to them shortly. Here once again is SC's contact information if you'd like to be in touch with her and learn more, www.scmoati.com. And then a few reminders before we get into our Q&A. For those who might have joined us a little bit later, again, I'd like to invite you to join our Accomplishing More with Less community. You can check out our blog on our website, people-onthego.com. And you can also search on Facebook and LinkedIn for Accomplishing More with Less to join our productivity groups there. And please also follow our founder, Pierre Kwand, on Twitter. I'd like to share with you about some upcoming webinars. We have our Accomplishing More with Less series, our landmark productivity series that'll get you going in all areas of workplace productivity coming up in May, or next week rather. Uh, the 10th, 17th, and 24th, three-part series there. We also have Excel techniques on the 19th, as well as managing and organizing your email inbox with Outlook on the 26th. 
Okay, and now for the Q&A. And if you hold tight after the q and I'll share with you again how you can enter to win a copy of SC's new book. Okay, great. Thank you for your questions here. Um, let's see. Let's go with this first one here. SC, um, Anna Lee asks, I don't understand how to apply the spirit role to how we think about our mobile strategy. All right, thank you for your question. So um, you're right, I didn't cover um, in detail the how to um, apply the spirit rule. What I use um, to apply the spirit rule is a, a set of internal and external filters. And I mentioned them, right? People filter, places filters, and then privacy permission uh, filters. Um, the way that you can apply that to your mobile strategy is look at these filters and go one by one and ask like, is this adding value to my user experience? So I'll give you an example, right? People and places filters. Like the different mobile platforms will add many of these um, as, as they grow and mature. So for example, a, a people feature is, you know, access to your um, address book, right? Um, or access to your calendar. Um, maybe it's also uh, access to um, information um, about your, your health uh, data or, or other uh, permissions that often um, services will ask you, like your camera roll, for example. So you, you can list these for the different platforms, whether it's mobile web or um, uh, Apple interface or Android and say, okay, this permission that's related to, you know, the people in my, in my uh, life, is this important for users or not to have it? And if so, when does it matter, very important question, when does it matter to ask it? So I'll give you a couple of examples here. Uh, I'll take WhatsApp again. In order to, for WhatsApp users to properly use the service, they need to be able to send push notifications back and forth. Now, no, that, means that means that the service, service requires, requires hearing a little bit of echo. You're hearing some echo, SC? Yes. Yes. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I'm not hearing it on this side. I don't believe anyone's uh, mentioned it there, but if, if it's bothering you, you could go ahead and disconnect for a moment to the speaker and then come back on. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I'm the only one hearing it. Hearing it. Not, a not a problem. Oh, so, actually, um, I'm so sorry. It seems there are a few people hearing it. Let me, um, can everyone just hold on just a moment and I'm going to see if I can fix that. Yeah, we had a few people come in. Okay, thank you everyone for your patience. Are you still hearing the echo now? I'm not hearing the echo anymore. You're not hearing it? Okay, great. We'll go ahead and roll with that then. <laughs> all right, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so let me go back to that example of WhatsApp, right? So in order for WhatsApp to be an effective service, it requires access to you know, your friends and it requires access to sending you push notifications so that you are aware of a message being sent to you uh, immediately as, as it gets um, sent. So WhatsApp cannot really function without access to your um, contact address book and access to push notifications. So it needs to ask for that permission as early as possible. In fact, it asks you for access to push notification and to your address book before you even sign up. Now, on the other hand, uh, not every WhatsApp user will send photos to one another. So when someone wants to send a photo, that's only when WhatsApp asks for access to your camera roll, as late as possible. Why? Because if WhatsApp is going to ask me for that permission early on, I would wonder why they need it, right? But if I already know that I want to send a photo, then I'm, I'm just going through the motion. 
So these filters, going back to your question, these filters, what you want to do is you want to list the list, you want to create a list of the filters available on each platform, see which one is useful to your service and your users, and then think, when do I need to require access to these different filters? Wonderful. Thank you so much, SC. Do you think that there's going to be, as we become increasingly mobile, that there's going to be kind of a social code and social codes built around what is appropriate and not in terms of, in terms of mobile technology? I do. In fact, if I compare the culture change that mobile is to the culture change that uh, television and radio represents, uh, I think we've learned to live really well with our TVs and radios. Uh, for in you know in most households, they're they're constantly running and constantly in the background. And then at some point, people tune in to the TV um, and out. Um, if you if you look at you know some early comments um, of television, people said it was going to you know suck people's soul. It was going to destroy family life. So definitely, I think we're going to develop these norms and these rules. Uh, I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but uh, we will do that. Wonderful. And in your book, do you address this issue around privacy and and you know individual protections and things like that? I definitely talk about this. Yes, I think it's a critical issue. Right. Right. Definitely. Okay. Great. And then I was wondering, um, do you have any tips for for smaller companies or groups? Um, you know, taking a, a lean approach to creating a mobile product, would it be any different from some of the examples and, and strategies that you gave today? Yes, absolutely. And I get asked that question by, by most of the small companies, like, okay, we don't have mm -hmm. necessarily the budgets to put in for mobile marketing or even building products on multiple platforms, so what do we need to do? And, you know, I would say, like, definitely you don't want to ignore mobile. So if you're thinking about going mobile, what you want to make sure you do is, first of all, define success, right? See mobile not as a cost, but as a way to generate new business lines, new revenue, new ways to engage. Number two, so, so define success. Number two, um, make sure that you um, test and try as much as you can. And what that means is that often um, you want to start with a mobile web strategy uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, creating apps. And then uh, number three, um, you know, look at, look at your competition and, and learn from that and see, like, what are the things that they're doing? Because one thing that you'll see on mobile is that you can be um, out of business very quickly because behaviors change so quickly. So really monitor your competition when you're a small business and you're hesitant to go mobile. Wonderful. Thank you. If there are any additional questions, please go ahead and ask them now. I have one more question here for you, um, SC. You mentioned some apps and products that you enjoy currently. I'm wondering, do you have any favorites that are really saving you a lot of time these days? Yes, I do. Um, in fact, uh, many. Um, the, one that I, the ones that I'll mention... Well, actually, a funny story on this um, before I, I, I dig into specific apps. Um, we, uh, we are doing experiments here in Silicon Valley to understand uh, what are people's favorite apps. And what's coming out is really interesting because it's very different than what you'll see on you know, services like App Annie or so that aggregate information across a broad range of um, of, of demographics. What people like here in Silicon Valley are productivity apps mm -hmm. and I'm no exception, right? So I will, uh, I love Dropbox. Dropbox completely changed my life. Um, I use, you know, obviously Lyft and Uber all the time. Uh, I use WhatsApp. Um, but, but when you compare that with what people use in general, um, you know, across demographics in the U.S., you'll see that this is very productivity-driven versus what people use, which is more like Pandora, Yelp, more like lifestyle um, services. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, SC, again, for sharing your thoughts today. And thank you all for participating and for your great questions. As promised, I would like to mention how you can enter for the giveaway. And we're, we're going to be giving away five books. And all you have to do is once we exit the session today, a feedback form will pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. And in doing so, you'll be entered into the drawing. We're going to take the first, fifth, 10th, 15th, and 20th person. So um, yeah, we would really appreciate that. Once again, thank you all for joining and I look forward to having you at a future session. By the way, we'll be sending you a note about how to uh, receive the recording. So be on the lookout for that as well. Thank you one more time, SC, and uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, SC, bye-bye.